Good morning, Turing AI UK. Thank you all very much for having me. Um, I'm Tabitha Goldstorp, the co-founder of COGEX, and today I'm wearing my hat uh, as the chair of the government's AI council and my background as the government's AI council. Give you a little bit of background. The council was formed based on the recommendations by the AI Review, a report written by Dame Wendy Hall and Jerome Pacenti, which spurred the government's billion pound AI sector deal and launched the Office for AI. We are going to talk to some of its members in a moment in this panel, but also other leading thinkers from across the industry. In June last year, the council agreed that we needed to set out our collective vision for the government on how AI should develop in the UK. And so began this process of writing an AI roadmap, a where to play, not a how to play for government. It set out a series of signposts and a strategic direction of travel for the government just to consider. And ultimately, we recommended the government write a national AI strategy. The good news is that the Secretary of State for Bayes, Quasi, and the Secretary of State for DCMS, Oliver Dowden, have agreed and announced just last week that the Office for AI will be writing a national AI strategy. And I know you'll be hearing from Sara Karagani, the head of the Office for AI, tomorrow morning in conversation with Adrian Weller. But we're here today to get more input. The council was founding on the understanding that we would amplify the voices of the widest community. So as part of the roadmap, we consulted over 450 individuals from our network. Many of you listening today were included in that, and we need your help now more than ever. So we want to turn as many of the recommendations in our roadmap into community-owned, actionable asks that can be put to the UK government as it considers its response and next steps for the growing of the AI industry in the UK. On the, way, on the AI Council website, you can fill out a form in order to get more involved. In total, we made 16 recommendations, and you'll see uh, these were bucketed into four key areas, which you'll see on your screen as the poll um, question. So we looked at research and development and innovation, skills and diversity, public infrastructure and, and national uh, and trust, cross-sector adoption. So if, you're, if uh, you'd like to answer the poll now, you could do, but I suggest you wait until we have met the members of our panel, because what we're going to do is explore these themes and get some thoughts. So first, we're going to come to Charlotte, the Deputy Executive Chair of EPRSRC, uh, who's actually on secondment for the University of Oxford, where she's currently the Professor of Structural Bioinformatics, and she was the head of the Department of Statistics there. Charlotte, tell me, What's the most important thing for this audience uh, to understand about the national AI strategy in relationship to R&D? I think for me, the most important thing is that the area of AI is not done. Um, it's a bit like suggesting that statistics is done. You know, so that's <laughs> been around a very long time and we're still improving and building on it and making it useful and we keep developing novel techniques. So the capacity of AI is there to do many amazing things already, but actually it's incredibly important that we keep going with research and innovation in kind of fundamental AI technologies and the development and invest in that kind of talent and research at that level, as well as the applications of it, which are kind of the next stages on. That's a really good point. And let's come to somebody else who knows that uh, AI is not done. Uh, so Adrian Smith, who you all know as the Institute Director for the Alan Turing Institute and also the President of the Royal Society. I'm also very lucky to have Adrian as a member of the Council. So Adrian, tell us, talk, talk briefly, what do you think needs to be done to ensure uh, AI R&D can flourish in the UK? Uh, as Charlotte said, we're, we're not done. Well, for starters, um, we could spend a whole day, what is AI? What is data science? Um, but it's a shortcut. Um, huge problems and challenges out there in the world with vast amounts of data uh, require huge amounts of disciplinary insights, whether it's mathematics, statistics, software engineering, computer science, uh, but also, and very importantly, the so social and behavioral sciences. Mm -hmm. So. What we do at the Turing Institute is try to bring people together at scale from across disciplines uh, to respond to major challenges and then out from the fundamental research, hopefully at the end of the day, go tools and practices which can help transform and respond to those challenges. But all this takes place through people. So we mm. really do need to build a community in the UK across those disciplines, recognizing that this is a, a global business and we need to be competitive. 
So how do we develop the next generation of leaders? How do we ensure that we stay up there as a major research nation? That, that's what we try to do in the Turing, brokering and convening across the talent of the UK. And it, it's, it's a worthy challenge. Um, let's come to Lord Tim Clement-Jones, the co-chair of the APPG on AI. Um, Tim, you, you wrote a report, AI in the UK, no room for complacency. You definitely point out there's much room for improvement. Can you explain a little bit about your concerns and hopes for the AI strategy? Well, thank you very much, Tabitha. I mean, the great thing is that in many ways we're on the same page as the roadmap. Uh, you know, the, the same kind of feeling that we've got to keep the momentum going in a number of areas. And I, I think, although you didn't go large on it, I think the whole ethical, uh, making ethical frameworks a reality uh, in terms of risk assessment and so on. Uh, you mentioned algorithms. That's really important that we get that right. Uh, you know, we're going to be talking about public trust. That's all part of the same equation. I think data governance in terms of the frameworks uh, that uh, we're also uh, talking about, I was very heartened by some recent work that uh, the Ada Lovelace and ODI have been doing. You know, that's, that is absolutely core because if we don't preserve, uh, if you like, the license to uh, uh, deploy AI, I think we're going to be in trouble. And the second big limb, uh, of course, is skills, diversity and inclusion. And uh, we, we aren't there yet. The government skills paper uh, was not ambitious enough. Uh, we've got to keep moving on that. So I really hope that the paper, uh, you know, quite apart from making sure that we tie in with our international initiatives, that we tackle things like lethal autonomous weapon issues, that we uh, you know, talk about the uh, sustainable development goals. You know, there are there are lots of things that a national AI strategy could do, but those two things for me are core. But uh, and the skills point, of course, we don't yet know what the impact of AI is going to be, mm -hmm. but we've got to prepare for it. We really do. Um, I think that brings you nicely on to uh, Jenny Tennyson, the President and Chief Strategy Advisor at ODI. Jenny, Tim made really clear that in order to feel the benefits of AI in the UK, we're going to need the right data infrastructure. And he, he's, he also said how great your, your work had been with Ada Lovelace. Can you give us an update on uh, and the audience on, on the work you're doing at ODI and also chairing the, the GPay group on data? I'd love to hear sort of what are the moving parts you think we need to get right in this next year? Oh, thanks, Tabitha. Um, so to focus on the um, ODI kind of work, first of all, I mean, it's really about building the right data infrastructure and the right data ecosystem to support that infrastructure and use it well. Um, and so we've got programs of work that we're, that we're starting and, and setting up around um, building data literacy, creating assurance around the use of data. Um, using innovation to drive the, the use of data across ecosystems, particularly towards the SDGs, building data institutions, so the organizations that steward data infrastructure long term, um, and also the, the kind of research and de development that you have to do with building evidence and, and looking into what the future might hold. So that's our kind of work program at, at ODI. Uh, the Global Partnership for AI, um, I co-chair the Data Governance Working Group, and there are other working groups looking specifically at responsible AI, the future of work, and commercialization and, and innovation. And at that level, it's very much about what's the um, what's the international uh, impetus that we can put behind these, these efforts, in particular with like-minded countries coming together to try and form... Um, you know, a, a common view about how we want to take AI forward and, and, and what good data governance looks like in my particular group. I think the thing that I would draw out is that, you know, um, a lot of what we're talking about here, particularly around the building of, of data infrastructure, they're long-term things. They're, they're setting up the right kinds of institutions and having the right rules and frameworks in place. And they're not things that happen overnight, right? And it, it's also something that we have to iterate over time. But that doesn't mean that we can't start now on concrete activities, right? And, and I think that it would be great to see us uh, getting behind, you know, um, concrete things like, uh, achieving net zero, um, uh, collective kind of health surveillance and, and really getting weight behind those and, and bringing to bear all the kind of theory about data infrastructure and skills that we need, et cetera, mm. et cetera, in something practical. 
And that perfectly brings me on to Fernando Lucini, the global machine learning engineer and data scientist lead at Accenture. So, um, Fernando, as uh, as Jenny said, it's not going to happen overnight, um, but we do need to make this a reality. And I saw your recent report on the need to professionalize approaches to AI. And I'd love to understand your thinking about how we move from R&D to production and what that looks like. Thanks, Tabitha. Um, interestingly, you have to think of it from our perspective as the people that implement thousands of projects with AI all the time. And when you look at them uh, and the success of them, uh, most of them are down to that point of professionalization, which is that we are great at the research, we're not so great at making it into production. And when you look at it and you think about the UK setting, we have some of the greatest careers in, in the world, right? We have some of the best finance, engineering, architecture, healthcare. So, and all of these have in common that they're all professionalized. There's lots of people that play a part in how those things get done and how you build a building. Uh, and and there's all of those people understand their role in what they're doing. All of them understand what are the boundaries of that role. It's for safety, you know, we don't have we don't have a, we don't not have engineers looking at at materials to build a building and so on. We, we understand these things. So what is critical, I think, to us continuing to lead in this space is to is to create those careers that will professionalize AI while still letting it, as as uh, as, uh, as Charlotte said, evolve and continue. There's plenty of research to be done in the space. There's plenty of growth to be done. But that doesn't stop us from having that, you know, really amazing professionalized career environment where everybody can thrive from the deep data scientists, like people in my, in my group, mm -hmm. to the engineers that want to put it together, to the ethicists that want to understand it, say, or the understanding of data, to, to what I think is, for, for example, the challenge of our era, which is ownership of data. Figuring out ownership of data is one of the challenges of our era, as, uh, as, as, as Jenny knows very well, and how AI then traps on top. So th that's the point of professionalization, which I think as, as the practitioners, we see a lot of, we see the extremes, really good mm. at research, not so good at getting into production, not so good at creating wonderful careers with all the colors and all the guardrails and all the flavors. So I think that'll be a, cr a critical thing in coming in the coming strategy to get this, uh, you know, the UK where we need to be. Mm. And we've got to be really conscious, I think, of the of the the weather, the, the political, the societal weather that we live in. Um, and as you're all talking, or I, I can't help but think, and so what does this what does this mean in the world of the post-pandemic um uh, you, Britain, post-pandemic world? And uh, I thought we could come to you, Charlotte, first on this, because uh, not only are you um EPRC, you're also the the director for the COVID UKRI's director for the COVID-19 response. So I'd love to hear a little bit about like what you've learned, what we can all learn, um, and then our, and then we'll come to, to to each of you to have a to have some thoughts on this. So I mean, it's sort of interesting thinking about how COVID has brought into sort of sharp relief lots of things. I don't think it's really changed the kind of awareness people had about you know how important these skills are, how important this type of research is, and how much it's needed across the board. But I don't think anyone can have gone through this and not noticed, even just on the news, the kind of need for expertise in computation, mathematics, statistics, modeling, AI. It's been up there, up front and center. And kind of domain examples of how this might become so important are things like drug discovery. We're going mm -hmm. to need therapeutic interventions for COVID. Um, but classical methods, experimental and computational, it, that's a 10, 20 year process. Now, AI methods are already accelerating this. You know, there are several companies using them and they're accelerating it a lot. But they all talk about a chronic lack of people who are trained to do this. And I think it relating also to Fernando's point, who have an idea of the kind of level of skills and the professionalism needed to do that. But it's not just drug discovery. I mean, I think Adrian mentioned this a bit. But to give you an idea across the portfolio, it's just there everywhere in times of the COVID research. So... Just to give you some ideas, vaccine manufacture, PPE improvements, including safe design and fitting, mental health, socioeconomic trajectories, food supply, cross-species transmission, seasonality, mm -hmm. environmental factors. How do you put those into COVID modelling? Modelling the airflow, remote literacy training for primary school age children, you know, mm -hmm. redesigning healthcare services journeys to work. Now, this isn't like oh, you need it for one thing, or there's one important technique. This is entirely ubiquitous across the system and you need people who understand it and can use that. So to me, really, it brought home the overwhelming need for people who can do this. And also a kind of understanding that you really need to think about how you can make it 
easy for lots of people to pick up the pieces that are needed to to understand what's going on within that as well. Mm. And the Turing were, 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 were front and center and really providing a lot of those people, um, weren't they, Adrian? I'd love to hear what you feel that the AI community and the Turing community have learned from, from the pandemic that we can take forward with for our future. Well, first, a quick bit of learning on the part of government. I mean, I, I really do think it's brought home uh, to government and those who work in Whitehall, fundamental importance of data. I mean, one mm. of the early problems with the COVID thing was you could give terrific advice on what you should do, and then you found you didn't have the timely data in order to respond. So I think understanding the importance of data, I mean, you could do fancy algorithms, but if you don't have data to work on, you know, we're in trouble. So d data to the fore and the other word skills. Um, and it, it's not just a collection of, of skills. We need more mathematicians or statisticians. What we found in Turing is really you do need to bring together people from across the disciplines, mathematics, computer science, software engineering, and interacting with social scientists and the rest. And so I think that's a challenge because within normal university environments, you structure somewhat in terms of departments. How do we create that kind of interdisciplinary understanding of, of the whole journey through data algorithms uh, into software that can be used by others? So. I think that that's a, a massive challenge. It's both qualitative, different kinds of mixed skill sets, but uh, boy, is also quantitative. We just need loads more people to get involved, not necessarily at the Nobel Prize gong level, mm. but armies of people who really are data literate and, and mm. work at all sorts of, of levels. Mm. So there's a, there is a huge challenge ahead. And uh, one thing that does worry me in, in the overall landscape is who's going to own a coherent joined up skills agenda? Yeah, well, I'd we're, love to... We're beginning to get a grip on what we need to do in terms of data, although, as mm. Jenny will know, tremendous challenges. But I don't see the same kind of overall mm. coherent grip of the skills agenda. Mm. I think we should come to the skills agenda next. And, and uh, Tim, I'm, I'm going to come to you on that. Before we do, I think it's it's right for Jenny to be able to respond on uh, the, the database, especially as Adrian thinks it's all sorted. <laughs> no, you've got a good grip. You've got a good grip on it. I'd love to know whether you feel like um, AI was able to um, achieve the potential that people maybe had hoped its response for the pandemic, or whether you think that there was there was a challenge that it faced as a community. I, I suppose I, I'm a, a little bit of a of an AI skeptic when it comes to these things. I I, I have great belief in um, uh, very basic uh, uses of data being incredibly powerful. Right, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to have masses of, of data science or um, or AI. Just knowing some things is 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 really helpful mm -hmm. for making decisions. So um, so I tend to view I, I tend to view it a, a bit wider than, than um, just AI. AI. you know data is useful for all sorts of decisions everywhere and um it, yeah it, to, to kind of echo some of adrian's points i think that the pandemic really illustrated how important our data infrastructure is how when we had good institutions in place that were already set up to be gathering data and to be sharing it out then we had a, an easier time than when we didn't mm. have those but also some some of the blind spots that we have you know um, around granularity of data so whether we were picking up on things like um, race and age and gender in in in, uh, in various data sets whether we um uh, and uh, in particular at local level kind of mm. information, which I think was in, was important. And the other thing that really came home to, to me through it was that this data wasn't just being useful for research purposes and evaluation, which is incredibly important, but also for day-to-day decision-making, mm. right? That, you know, operationally, people needed to know things quickly in order to act on them and on um, the um, and just uh, the transparency aspects of, of knowing information and how secure that made the public feel mm. about whether or not the government was on top of the the pandemic response right so you know there's that kind of broader picture of data getting to people who who need it whether it's the public or whether it's decision makers in local government or um or, or even within the communities you know civil society organizations and not all of it needs ai to be useful right. but of course that data infrastructure does need to be able to underpin the, the ai that we want to create 
Mm. Fernando, um, I, I know that you are um, obviously helping many of your clients grapple with what Jenny has just been talking about. Is there one case study or one experience that you feel um, we can really learn from in terms of our future resilience as a country? Well, 10 seconds on, on Jenny's point. If you look at mm. corporates and their view problem of data, it's massive. It is not sorted in any way, shape or form. Mm. It is the day-to-day -day gripe of all CEOs around the world. Um, most of them because they see data as a, as a cost, not as an asset. So the clever ones are thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's the asset. So I need a, I need a business strategy you know, for my data, not, a, you know, not a, a data strategy for my business. It's kind of one of those funny, funny, funny ones. Um, I, I'll tell you what, one of the things that surprised me through this whole COVID situation is one of the things that AI could do very well, which is, for example, synthetic data creation. Uh, and I mean, true synthetic data, so true, mm. true synthetic data using GANs and variational onto encoders and clever things like that. Um, and the, one of the things, you know, Adrian was talking about, you, we don't need the rocket scientists. It's the kind of thing that needs that kind of rocket scientists to get done. But you would have thought it would have been done during this period where we were having endless conversations across the world. Mm. And I'm the chief data scientist globally of Accenture. And you had these crazy conversations where you thought, well, if I get that data over there and I connect it with this thing over here, I could do my research in a much stronger way, but there's no chance that's going to happen. Whereas something like synthetic data could have solved that in, in one swift go. Um, and that, that, that didn't happen. Mm. Um, we were, it's just one of those things. It happened a little bit. There's a, there's a few signs right. of it happening here and here and here and there. Um, great signs uh, through, through this period. I think we were at a point where we were all thinking, this is corporates now. We're thinking we've invested a lot in AI. They were starting to wonder where the value was coming from, a bit tired of the stories and not going into production, and COVID hit. Right. So suddenly this turned the cameras back inside because it is from seven, for, for many people dealing with uh, things like supply chain and mm -hmm. stuff that were affected, it became a, a survival moment. Yeah. How do I survive? Now it's no longer, why is this not making the money that I need or the return of citizen value? How do I, how do I survive? So there's a lot mm. of stories of looking back at people that have that have done very well. So I done very well that have, that have surpassed maybe and survived and got through this. Um, always there's a tear in everybody's eye around that some of this has been pure survival and it's really mm. sort of sad to see. And there's others that have managed to survive. You look at the retailers managing to the big retailers. They just managed to turn their guns, use AI, and still sell us stuff. But the small retailers obviously are suffering terribly. So yeah. it's a, it's it's very difficult to say what is a great you know story when when it's it's been a, it's a, been that game of two halves mm. at this point uh, at least as I can see it. But big corporates, I say they went from hey why is this not doing what we needed to do yeah. to we might need it to survive, and now that they're coming out the other side they're thinking all right so how do we do more of that what the survival made us do yes survival and, and, made us behave yeah. in a way can we do more of that yes. so we all know that this is very very difficult to burn bright very yeah. long like they've done right yeah we all do it's it's been it's taken its toll um let's come to the point that adrian made around um the 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 need the skill the skills um, challenge we have. Tim, I know that you have looked into this a lot and you spoke about it in your latest report. I'd love to, if you just frame the challenge that you and, and your um, group in the Lords uh, saw in your report. Well, I think we saw two strands really, Tabitha. I mean, there is the specialist AI skills area mm -hmm. and I think we're on a good trajectory there, but I absolutely agree with Adrian that this is a cross-disciplinary issue. Um, you know, it's the creative use of AI is not just a STEM skill. You know, you need to uh, have, a, have, a, have a complete, you know, cross-section there. And that's mm -hmm. what makes these conversion courses so exciting as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the great, you know, we uh, were really keen on those in both our reports but the the really difficult nut to crack is how to work with AI if you are if you like a normal citizen employee and what worries me is you know we've seen the acceleration I mean Fernando was extremely eloquent on that I think that's exactly what's happening there is an acceleration but of course we have to meet that and the possibility of digital exclusion and not understanding how to work with AI it's all there and actually I really love the recommendation for an online academy for 
understanding AI that you had in the roadmap. But, you know, um, it's how to get from A to B as far as that's concerned. And that's where I think the government's recent skills for jobs paper falls mm. down. It's not it's not nearly ambitious enough. I mean, the whole idea of these kind of lifelong loans and mm. stuff like this. I mean, you know, somebody needs to grab this by the scruff of the neck, quite honestly. <laughs> Uh, and, I'm with uh, you. Uh, you know, they really do. And I hope that the AI strategy will, will come up with that. But, you know, this is a huge concern. And, you know, we can all we can either be on the, you know, the the the, the Carl Frey spectrum and say uh, it's doom and gloom or, you know, we can be a lot more optimistic, you know, a la McKinsey or whatever. But mm. nevertheless, we've got to meet the future. And I don't think we're anything like that. And I think the pandemic has absolutely identified, you know, uh, in a sense, the fact that we've got to speed up on this. Totally. Sh Charlotte, um, as Tim says, we've got to meet the future. Um, what are you doing at, uh, at EPRSC around skills? What things should the, could the audience know about, um, how, you know, how you're uh, arming the, the population in this area? So I suspect that, you know, the research councils, the UKRI and EPSRC are not so much arming the entire population. I think True. <laughs> Tim is talking about there. A lot of, because of what we're for, has been trying to help the funding at, you know, a particular level where you're talking about doctoral students, postdocs and fellowships. So there's been quite a large increase in the number of doctoral students around um, mm. AI. The problem is that if you look at the numbers, the actual number we need is probably five times the number, five to 10 times the number that we currently have. So this is not like a, a small increase. If you really mm. want to do set changes here, it's not just in the general population. I also need to arm the academic population. Most mm. of them are you know, not skilled in this area. And then we also try to do you know, things that are sort of sitting further up the spectrum. So with the Turing and others, we've got the Turing fellowships for AI. Mm. And those have been really trying to bring in kind of high top level talent starters and people beginning in that to really try and do step changes to create mm. um i think of them as kind of people who will draw others towards them create a kind of sticky network of people that will really mm. build ai expertise and as adrian was talking about i think that you know the turing is one of the key places for that bringing in not just people who think of ai as their research but people who are going to use it build from it and those kind of things mm. so i think there's a huge need across all these levels. I completely agree with the comments around the sort of general skilling of the population. I think that's mm. something that's really key. I mean, I think Adrian's words, an army is needed is really true there. Yeah. But we also need to skill at the level in the academic population, you know, and across the industry where you've got people who are literate in mathematics, mm. computation, computer science, but that's not the same. And, you know, there's a set of skills they still need to learn and we need to work out ways to do that too. Mm. And we'll come to, to Jenny and Fernando on the, 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 the wider population in the army. But before we do, I just want to talk a little bit about how do you make sure that the, the people that you are uh, skilling remain, or oh, sorry, uh, become a more diverse group of people considering the existing challenges that we've had in the industry? What works going on there? So I think, I mean, for us, there's lots of things going on there. And it it is actually a really difficult challenge. There's a kind mm. of go through. You can't change the population of people aged 21 who are interested in something if you're not already thinking about the people aged five. Mm. You know, there's a long-term challenge about this. But it's also about making sure that the availability of the information is there, that you're trying to reach out to all of the um, groups. It's trying to think in creative ways because you not always want to reach into the same population of people. And yeah. I think, you know, in many things, we can be guilty of that. So trying to work out how you approach lots of different populations mm -hmm. of people. And that some of this is to do with reskilling as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got this interest across a broad range, you can bring people in who wouldn't have thought of computer science, AI statistics when they were 18, but they're thinking about it a lot now. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> and that's great. So I think mm -hmm. there's lots of opportunities to do that, but it is something we're gonna to need to keep working on because mm. the diversity of the population of people who are doing this currently is not as high as we would like it to be in, you know, pick any characteristic. I can see Adrian wants to come in. Yeah. Tantha, can I make a comment? Please there? I do. think what the thing that um, Amanda Soloway referred to, the, the big increase in the conversion masters, mm. You know, if you think through to the implications of a lot of this stuff for regulation and the rest, there's a huge legal aspect. So if you if you 
can design the kind of conversion masters that will attract law graduates, arts and humanities graduates of various kinds. You've immediately done something to the diversity agenda because you've got much more diversity in those streams than in the standard STEM stream. Mm. And we've seen the statistics of those those non STEM conversions really um, 50% women 20% black, uh, the, the amazing number of diversity yeah. in, in existing and sort of, um, for me, it's a little bit like, you know, we've proved the model and now as, as Tim said, we, we need to double down in that area. Um, I think Dame Wendy Hall's recommendation of, of doing those in the review was really well point. So let's move on to um, in our last sort of uh, eight minutes, let's talk about um, the role that the AI community has in making sure that the general public are excited about artificial intelligence, are able to be conscious consumers, um, safe conscious consumers. Um, Fernando, you're obviously helping um, uh, brands all the time create artificial intelligence that needs to be used by the, the general public. What are you seeing um, as the wraparound that needs to come with these products to make sure that it's actually fit for purpose and can be um, consciously consumed? It's funny, Tabitha, because I think you and I have discussed this over the last few <laughs> years on and off, and yeah. it hasn't changed. No, uh, I it's know. Still, it, it hasn't changed. It still goes back to transparency and being open mm. about your intentions and being vocal about how you want to do things and why you want to do things and what they mean. Because we still have an entire, an entire, you know, sway of the country who is not understanding AI is, is humanizing AI because it's, it's mm. natural, it's perfectly normal, um, but don't quite understand how it works. So, so it is, it is to some degree the um, the task of companies to be transparent and explain to people why these things exist, how they exist, how they help. Mm. Uh, one challenge that I give my customers, which is uh, I ho hopefully it'll make you laugh, is is to spend the day and write down in the day how AI has affected their life. Yeah. So wake up in the morning and from the moment their alarm clock on their phone, on their on their watch, intelligent watch, start trying to count how many times AI is in their life and you'll be shocked because I do a parallel between somebody that understands AI and somebody that doesn't and the, the list is enormous for the people that understand it and, and you know, okay for the people that are not quite into the topic. So companies do have a responsibility to, to some degree in that narrative to tell people how AI is helping to do mm -hmm. that education, to tell their employees what uh, what their you know what their values are. Tim, you mentioned uh, talk about weapons and things. So, what are they standing in any of these topics as they're giving a service to the citizenship? Mm -hmm. So, tell me that the people that are doing very well tend to be very good at explaining this, saying mm -hmm. how it's affecting, why it's affecting it, what it's doing, how it's doing it, and what it represents. The people that are not doing so good, it's not because they don't want to do great, but because they're struggling in getting the thing working and doing you know what mm -hmm. it's supposed to do and helping its customers never mind trying to explain how it works which is a bit more of an advanced uh, an advanced uh, science my prediction in the next three years is this um that if we're not in a position where we're going to have models talking to models talking to models talking to models talking to models if we're not in a position where today we're exercising the muscle of explaining how all of this is working we will have Im almost impossible task of explaining yeah. it to the people we serve yeah. So today is now is the time to do that, and we can do that in, in government education and all these. We can do that from the from 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 there, but the companies have to put their you know, their mm -hmm. calories into it. Does that does that make sense? It really does. I, I'm really I'm so with you on the muscle memory, uh, your collective muscle memory. And Jenny, at the ODI, um, I would say that you're one of the better groups at, at uh, public engagement and actually making things clear. Um, what advice do you have for, for people listening in, in, uh, in Tim's suggestion of taking this by the scruff of the neck? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that um, I, I divide up in, into kind of two two strands there's the strand which we were talking about a little bit earlier which is is uh, skilling up the workforce around AI and, and providing literacy for for um, say business leaders to be able to understand what how AI and data should be used in their business and what the right business models are to use around it and so on um, and then there's the kind of general public kind of uh, the, the people who are uh, using AI or affected by AI on a data on a day-to-day -day basis um, and, and I, I think 
think, you know, uh, I completely agree with Fernando's points around transparency and needing to explain things well and all of those kinds of things. Informing people is great, but getting them to participate is how we get them to, to really uh, get to grips with the subtleties and, and, and um, challenges around AI and data. Mm. Um, I think we have a tendency to to think that a, a big global conversation about all types of data and all types of AI will somehow make everything in better. And I really think that that's not the case, that, that, um, that how people feel and how they engage with the use of data and AI is very context dependent, domain dependent. And so the conversations need to happen at that kind of level, right? It's mm. the individual application level, it's in the individual workplace um, that, that those conversations need to happen, which means that you need to equip the people who are having those conversations, business leaders or the, the doctors in the surgery or whatever it is, to be able to have the, the, those conversations with um, their, their, their clients or their customers or their citizens or whatever. Um, but I also think we need to, as, as organizations, just get a lot better at structured participation exercises with mm. portions of the public in, and properly listen to them so I, I mean, a lot of the a lot of participation and engagement is just telling people what we're trying to do when I think that for an active involved citizenry around data and AI we also need to be listening and and uh, uh, understanding the challenge that comes back I couldn't agree more that listening is so difficult. Tim, I saw you nodding. Have you seen good examples of the listening? Have you do you have a similar desire for the for or advice for, for those listening? One, <laughs> for thing how we can listen? one thing governments aren't very good at is listening. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of things like citizens' juries. Uh, mm. but what I do know is that you've got to get the mechanisms in place because you know, I'm a bit of a crack record on the public trust issue. Uh, you know, in both our reports, I mean, what terrifies me is if we go down a kind of GM foods route where people do not really understand, we don't explain, you know, the benefits, we don't look uh, uh, at making transparent what the regulation is and so on. You know, that's why I thought, you know, the, the, the sustainable development goals are something that we can, you know, talk about in the context of AI, I think, in a really positive way. But, you know, there's a whole lot of work going on out there about making sure that we actually translate those ethics into, if you like, proportionate regulation. People mm -hmm. are quite worried about, you know, live facial recognition. They're worried about things like algorithmic decision making in the public sector, particularly. You know, we can't can't exist for very long without a risk framework basically mm. and you know people like the Council of Europe as you know Tabitha are doing work on this so the OCD uh, the EU and so on now you know we, it's got to be proportionate it, it absolutely mm. has to be but you know I don't think we can escape for very long without the government actually seizing this agenda and taking mm. it forward and that will help build public trust as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, uh, one of the topics I wanted to come to, but we haven't had time for is, is regulation, because obviously we can't expect the public to, um, to, to self-protect. Um, Adrian, it'd be, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts while we're waiting for sort of the, the, the uh, as Tim sort of described the government to take hold of this. What are the things that the audience listening now, that you know, the AI UK Turing audience can start to do just in their own work to get themselves into a situation where they're creating, um, uh, you know, research that works for the people as Jenny described and listening to the people? Well, from the point of view of, of as it were, the research community, mm. um, it's really repeating what I said earlier, putting people in an environment where they mix across disciplines and yeah. right at the very beginning, you're building safe, ethical and trust into uh, the whole way you approach stuff. I think it's a, a big, deep cultural issue. This is not a techie business. It, you know, it's techie in parts, mm. um, but it, it's much wider than that. I just briefly on the regulatory front, uh, one of the, so it's a sort of paradox. People are sometimes suspicious of, of government regulation, but on the other hand, they trust it. They hope the medicines have been through the proper approvals. And we have regulatory international frameworks in, in manufacturing, in finance, you know, that we behave properly. 
Uh, so I think there's an interesting additional thing that, of course, we're not going to talk about now because we don't have time, which is the international dimension of how mm. do we need to and how would we get agreement on kind of standards and regulations? Yeah, luckily, there's some good sessions on that later today, Adrian. But I think better that we close on on the uh, the, the call that you said there really to the to the research community around this is not just techie, this is about everybody, this is about community. And I'm really, really, yeah, yeah. I echo that so wholeheartedly. And I want as many people as possible listening to fill out the form on the AI Council website, get involved. We're, we're doing workshops like this all over the, the Zoom <laughs> um, to, to get more and more feedback. So thank you all uh, on this panel and thank you all for listening. I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye.